Thank you, thank you. Thank you, you're most kind. Mm. Welcome to the show. That reminds me. This probably is about the most self-indulgent show I've ever done in my life. It's a sort of humorous nostalgia, an anecdotal trawl through the memorabilia of my long and varied life spent mostly in that amazing and unpredictable world which we call show business. And what I'm going to try and do for the next 28 minutes is to regale you with some of the anecdotes and some of the things that have happened in a very eventful and unpredictable life. And um, I'll try and see if I can entertain you with them and see if I can take you out of yourselves for a few minutes in this little cavern under the street here at Piccadilly Circus. And um, so because, you see, I'm one of those people that, that was imbued with the idea of going to the show business from the very earliest age that I can possibly remember. I was born, actually, in a small market town in Lincolnshire called Grantham, and the reason I mention that, it usually gets a response, because most people know that this very well-known politician was born in Grantham. In fact, I believe that members of the Tory party have been known to say on occasions to Margaret Thatcher, did you know that you were born in the same town as Nicholas Parsons? <laughs> They were the ones who didn't vote for her when she had her leadership crisis. Um, I also went to the same school as Margaret Thatcher. It was then, of course, was Margaret Roberts, uh, which was the Kesterman and Grantham High School for Girls. <laughs> I don't know why you laugh. You see, it wasn't that I was unsure of my sexuality or that my parents were. It is in the kindergarten of the high school they also took boys. Well, then my parents, as often happened with parents who can afford it, they sent me to a boarding prep school in Hendon. Now, maybe there's some good ones, but this was something out of a chapter from Charles Dickens. It really was. I mean, all the masters seemed to be people who had been damaged in some way in the First World War and were exercising their frustrations on the youngsters in their charge. But you find, if you're unhappy, your survival course, and mine was humour. And I found I could make my chums laugh. And, of course, I used to rag the masters, for which I became. I would be taken off, and I get six of the best. But, you know, sometimes in looking back, I used to think that the laughs I got were worth the indignities that I suffered. Nowadays, I say I get paid for my laughs. In those days, I used to get six on my bum. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, I survived it. Uh, just. But then I went to a very nice school. I went to College Corps, then on to St. Paul's. And then the war began. And uh, after a bit, I got my matric, and my parents, for some reason, decided to take me away from school. They thought I was a non-achiever. It was difficult. I, I was dyslexic at a time when they didn't know what dyslexia was, and they thought I was just rather slow and backward. And, of course, I had a stutter, you see, which didn't help. And um, my father said to me, I think it's about time you decided what you're going to do. And I said, Dad, there's only one thing I've ever wanted to do. You know, I want to be an actor. And his reply was very succinct. We know all about that, but let's be serious. <laughs> Uh, my mother was horrified. She was convinced that the show business was a world of deprivation. We were full of dissipated, depraved and perverted human beings. You know, and if I went into that, I would be dragged down into the mar and finish up as some depraved alcoholic or perverted, I don't know. In fact, I said to her, quite later when I was already in the business, I said, Mother, I've never answered it because you, you, you enjoy going to the theatre. And she said, yes, I, I, I do. And I said, you admire people like Edith Evans and Sybil Thorndike and Rafe Richardson. She said, yes. I said, well, do you think they are all like that? And she thought for a moment and said, no. But isn't it a pity they have to work with those sort of people? <laughs> anyway, they were determined I wasn't going to go into show business. And I must say, it was difficult the war was on. And my uncle took a hand, because I've always been rather clever at making things and repairing things. And he thought, why not engineering? He got in touch with some relations in Scotland. They got in touch with friends. And the next thing I knew, I'd been offered an apprenticeship in an engineering work on Clydebank, a firm called Drysales, and made pumps and turbines. And then during the middle of the war, with the blackout and all the other indignities and problems, I was on a train going up to Glasgow, only barely 16 years of age. I found my way to the YMCA, got some digs, got a boiler suit. And the next day, I was on the tram car going down to Yoko on Clydebank to begin my apprenticeship. I had entered another world. It was a traumatic experience. As I walked in the blackout with the snow on the ground, I thought they were actually speaking another language. A break to you, I shall not for a mouth, and no free. I don't know, my name is your jaw. And they were using, I discovered words as adjectives that I'd only seen written on lavatory walls before. <laughs> anyway, 
Again, one survive, you find your survival kit. And mine was, again, humor. I got friendly with them all. I never changed the way I spoke or anything like that. And in fact, I mean, they were odd. It was an odd environment for me to be suddenly pitchforked into, but I must have seemed even more of an odd ball to them. And, of course, coming straight from an English public school, I mean, I, I talk very, very much more like that because in the 40s and 50s, we all did. You know, I mean, if you look at some of those films, the 40s and 50s, we're all talking a bit like that, aren't we? I mean, I remember sometimes in an afternoon, I'll see one of the old films that I was in in the 50s, and there am I, talking like that, and I'm so embarrassing. Hello, Mary, it's Johnny Goodshow. Shall we go down to the old rubber dub dub and have a little job? <laughs> Jolly good, what fun. Yes. Oh, let's go. How are you? Oh, here we go. And, you know, but we did. And, you know, the, the, the sort of speech patterns have evened out a bit. And um, I was doing impersonations, and I was impersonating, you know, the, the film stars and the radio stars of the time. And um, I was really determined to get somehow into show business. And the great discovery man of that period, Carol Levis, came to the Glasgow Empire. And I thought, maybe this is my opportunity. So it did need a lot of courage. And I went along to the stage door and I asked to see Carol Levis. His manager came out to greet me. And as so often happened then and even now, when one got very tense or nervous, my stutter became worse. And I remember saying to him, I, 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 I've, I've come to see, 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 see if I can do an, an, an audition. And he said, what, what, what? No, he didn't have a stutter, did he? <laughs> <laughs> he said, what do you do? And I said, I do imper Im 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 impersonations. And I'm not joking. He actually said to me, who do you impersonate? People with impediments? <laughs> anyway, Carol Levis saw me, and I always found when I walked on the stage, was in control of the situation, the speech problem I had seemed to disintegrate to some extent, and I did a good audition, and Carol gave me my first professional job as an impersonator. On the weekends, Carol had a new series called Happy Go Lucky Hour. And at that time, the BBC, in their wisdom, decided that all their comedy shows should come from a little theatre they'd taken in Bangor, in North Wales, on the assumption because it was the furthest point away from where the Germans would fly in and least likely to be bombed. But what they overlooked was that during the war, the government, in their wisdom, had taken down all the signposts throughout the country and all the station signs on the premise that if the Germans ever landed here, they wouldn't know where they were. <laughs> Unfortunately, hardly anybody else in the country knew where they were. And trying to get to Bangor and changing trains perhaps twice, you didn't know which station to get off, and nobody would talk to you on the stations because they'd seen the notices which said, careless talk costs lives. So they wouldn't speak to you because you might have been a German spy or something, you see. And Anyway, I did these shows in Bangor, and I carried on with the apprenticeship. And I was working in the pattern shop where you make the wooden patterns for the pumps that the firm made. And we had a most amazing foreman, who I used to take off, of course. His name was Jock Cunningham. And the thing about Jock was that he had loose dances. As a matter of fact, as he spoke, he, you could actually see his dances moving back and forth <laughs> across his mouth. It was quite, and, and you just thought, and you sort of got riveted by that. <laughs> and also, Jock was a man on a short fuse. When he got to swearing, he couldn't actually contain himself properly, and he'd actually spit his dentures up so he could swear more freely. <laughs> I mean, he'd go up to one of the, one of the men in his group and say, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the junior? No, 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 it's yourself. Look, look at the drawing, you should be sick. I'll tell you, that's the well, well, listen, I'm a guy for here. I'm clear. Listen, I'll oh, put a little gear in your pocket. If you don't put it, I'll put it down. Oh. <laughs> and then he put his teeth back in his mouth again. He was a character. He, he never understood me. Well, you can understand it, can't you? And um, he had his little office, which was what he called his box. It was lightly raised. He could survey the whole domain in front of him. And in those days, of course, the foreman, or the gaffers, as we called them, they were the boss there. They could clip an apprentice around their ear, and, you know, there's no coming back. He said, uh, he said, he said I'm putting you there, because I, I, I think you're a troublemaker. I think you impersonate me. <laughs> so, you get up in your tracks. Now, here there were two places outside the building which were called toilets. I mean, th th I mean th th that was a sort of complimentary term for them. They'd be condemned by any sanitary inspector today. You weren't allowed to smoke because we were working with wood. And most of the young apprentices would go out to these two little places to have a drag or a fag. And uh, on this occasion, I'd left my, my bench. And she said, where are you going? I, I said, I'm going out to the loo, Jock. She said, what are you going to do? I said, what do you think I'm going to do? He says, well, don't you belong, because I don't know how long it takes. <laughs> well, I get out there, the first door shut. 
Try the second door. Walk in. There's three of my young mates there. He says, here, come in, Nick. Come in. Close the door. Don't, 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 don't let Jock hear us. He said, carry on. Well, it's a bit difficult to carry on, as you can imagine. <laughs> but then suddenly, for no reason at all, one of them suddenly said, hey, Nick, give us one of your impersonations. Give us Charles Boyer. Now, can you visualize this situation? One of them was standing on the seat of the bank, holding onto the cistern like that. Another one was behind this door, sort of tucked in there. And the other one was sort of tucked in on the other side. And I stood facing these three fellows, sort of saying, no, 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 my darling. Don't move. As you stand there with the light on your hair and your image in the mirror behind, this is how I want to remember you. Oh, Gina, that's great. Oh, I remember that film. Betty Davis show you all this in heaven. Oh, it's great. So, hey, now, give us Jimmy Stewart. No, 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 listen, listen, I just want to say I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm in the most embarrassing situation. I came out here to obey the laws of nature, and you, you got me doing this. I just know this film. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Ah, I don't know whether I can carry on. Oh, Gina, that's fantastic. That's great. Oh, I love you, Jimmy Stewart. And I went through the whole repertoire, the whole lot, and they suddenly said, hey, now, give us your piece of resistance. Give us Winston Churchill. I said, never before in the history of human endeavor has a young man found himself in such a, a compromising situation, standing here as I do, facing three stalwart lads, endeavoring to obey the laws of nature. He said, come on, I'll you and I was back at my bench. <laughs> yeah, the war went on. I finished up the Merchant Navy, didn't actually sail. I came back to London and still determined to be an actor. Parents still endeavoured to stop me. I got one or two little jobs in the West End and I thought, no, I must learn my job. I must go and work in repertory because there's some great repertory companies around at that time where they did one play at night and you learnt and rehearsed another play during the day. I went to the new theatre in Bromley, actually started because I went down there to play the American in While the Sun Shines, Terence Rattigan's play, and the man who ran that repertory theatre, Ronnie Carr, great director, great producer, said, I think you should stay on. And I thought, yeah, that would be a good idea. And um, it gave me a contract for 12 weeks and I stayed for two years. But I played every single part imaginable. I really learnt my craft and learnt how to walk a stage, as we say in show business terms. There were some wonderful people in that repertory camp at the time, and the leading lady was Noel Gordon. Lovely lady. I think I was secretly in love with her. She was gorgeous and sweet and a brilliant actress. And um, later on, Sheila Hancock uh, came there. She was wonderful. And Alec McCowan started there. A lot of people went through that wonderful repertory company. And one of the people who came down occasionally to a guest in one or two shows was Kenneth Williams. <laughs> I got on very well with him. The rest of the cast didn't know how to take him at all. He was eccentric and delightful even in those days. And he was a great gift for ad-libbing, which reminds me of probably one of the greatest moments of ad lib I've ever experienced in the theatre. Because when you're doing a show live on stage, you know, and something goes wrong, it's a challenge sometimes to work your way out of it. And this particular instance was a thriller in which Kenneth was playing a rather nasty sort of character who um, everybody really hated him. And I was playing the sort of hero type. And there came a moment in the play when he produces a gun and I then see this, make a lunge at him, grab the gun, but the gun actually goes off and he gets shot. And he dies an agonizing death. Nobody in the audience is sorry because they didn't like him at all. <laughs> but he'd given a rather character, civilian character. Now, when you use a gun in the theatre on the stage, you use blank cartridges. Well, of course, it's obvious it has to go to me, of course. You, otherwise, I mean, you, you run out of actors in no time. Uh, but they're not always very reliable. So if the gun doesn't go off, what the audience actually hears is a click. And then the stage manager in the wings has another gun and he fires the gun and then the audience, it's, the shot comes from over there somewhere and it's supposed to have been here in the centre of the stage. The audience, you know, they, they know what should have happened. On this particular night, Kenneth gets the gun, leap forward, grab it, and there's a click. We pause for a second and from the wings came click. <laughs> and we both stood paralysed for a second. Then I can assure you that when something really drastic like is wrong, your adrenaline pumps quicker than you knew it was possible. So I did the only thing, I got the gun, I had the gun in my hand, I said, right, stick him up! 
Stick him up. Put your hands up. Move back. Move back. Now, in my mind was to get him into the wings to see if I could get some other way to finish him off. Say, keep going. Go back. Go back. Back. Yes, go on. Now you think you're going to get away with that. Oh, you little scardy. Oh, yeah. And we got right into the wings, and I realized we'd gone off the wrong side. The stage manager was the other side. So I quickly said, Ken, take the gun. Take the gun. Chase me back. So I came back with my hands up, and he came with a gun saying, Yeah, you think you're going to get away with that, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You think, no, you can't mess about with me. No. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. And we went right off into the wings on the other side of the stage. And there was a stage manager and half the cast who weren't on the stage just looking at us in amazement. I said, Well, give me something. No, a gun, a knife, no, no, a mallet, anything, a bottle, I've got to kill him. Oh, no, for goodness sake. So I said, Ken, give me the gun. So I grabbed the gun. I said, put your hands up. I said, oh, all right. So oh, that was very clever. <laughs> and I came back with his, with his hands up and he was backing over. And we thought, how are we going to finish it? And we got to the end of the stage. I don't know what the audience were thinking by this time. I think they were in a stupor. And suddenly, Kenneth got to centre stage. And this was where the inspiration occurred. He sort of went downstage a bit, looked up at me and said, Throw it at me! <laughs> so I thought, well, I don't know anything. So I took the gun and I threw it at his stomach. I said, take that, you scoundrel! And Kenneth then grabbed his stomach and went into his full agonising death seat. <laughs> no, you got me. You swine. I'm going. I'm going. You never told me the gun was poisoned. <laughs> <laughs> Show business. Show business. Right. Yes, I went to the famous Windmill Theatre, which fascinates everybody. And uh, I did an audition. It was run by an amazing entrepreneur and businessman called Vivian Van Dam. He used to, he said he discovered comedians, but I don't know why, because he didn't have much sense of humour. He always had to be known by his initials of VD, which was... <laughs> uh, but he did present in a brilliant little review show there, which was very tasteful, actually. I mean, everybody thinks it's somewhere racy and exciting, but the, at that particular time, the Lord Chamberlain's office existed, so everything had to be passed by the Lord Chamberlain before it could be seen on the stage. So everything was very discreet, and in comparison with what you can see nowadays, both on the stage and on television and elsewhere, I mean, it was almost antiseptic. It was run like a cinema, six shows a day, six days of the week. We did 36 shows, and it was continuous. So if people vacated their seats in the front, and others wanted to stay on, they could come down. So the comic always followed the big, exciting number, the fan dance. But all these men, they're nearly always men, most of them in sort of dirty Mac sitting there, and all their hot breath was still with them. And you would have to follow that. And as you came on, a lot of people would be moving to take the seats which were vacated in the front, you see. And you'd have to keep going, and you recognize faces that you've seen in the first two houses, or the three houses sometimes. And, you know, and then as you started, half of them would put their newspapers up and start read. And you had to fight against this. It was great, great experience, but um, didn't teach you how to be a comedian. It just taught you how to survive. <laughs> and it reminds me of one of the most outstanding moments when I was there, because this fan dance, which I've mentioned, um, which a girl was, of course, Starker's behind it. She had these two wonderful fans, and she'd do this sort of dance. Now, the Lord Chamberlain's office had an incredible ruling at that time. You were not allowed to appear naked on the stage, but you could do it if you didn't move. So you could appear quite stationary. So while the fan dance was going on, there was a girl on a pedestal not far behind, standing up there in a very discreet pose with one knee slightly forward, keeping her profile there, and she never moved. She couldn't move. And you could almost hear the hot breath in the audience. <laughs> and on one occasion, this poor girl got, either she got a fly in her throat, or she got a fit of something went her off. She suddenly started to cough. <coughs> And she tore full frontal to the audience, and everything, <laughs> she was coughing, <coughs> was shaking, you see, like this. And, you know, and it, it was, they've never seen anything like it, but it got a round of applause. <laughs> the biggest round of applause I've ever heard in my life. Of course, the stage manager was so worried, he brought the curtain down like that. She so thought, you know, at any time they'd lose their license. <laughs> then it was about 1956. Independent television had just begun. And George and Alfred Black had been asked by ATV to make a new comedy show. And they announced that they were going to discover the new and unknown stars of independent television. Now, they gave this show more hype than it was possible to give it. They gave it the title of Strike a New Note, which was the title of their father's famous show during the war, which discovered Sid Field and Terry Thomas and Zoe Gale, and one or two others. And they gave it so much publicity, I don't think they could possibly live up to it. And... Uh, I happened to see the very first show, 
And it was really pretty ghastly. There was one chap in it I thought was rather talented. Had terrible material, but he was good. Had a round face and a little moustache and remembered his name was Arthur Haynes. The following week, I happened to catch the show again quite by chance. And it was even worse. Pathetic. And the following morning, my agent phoned me, Richard Stone. He said, Nicholas, have you seen a program called Strike a New Note? And I said, isn't it absolutely terrible? He said, they want you to join it. <laughs> I said, when do I start? <laughs> we don't question things in show business. I joined the show. I did a little bit of comparing to begin with and one or two sort of my little stand-up bits. And then at the end of six shows, George Black said, I'm going to get rid of everybody else. But I'm going to keep Arthur Haynes and you. And I think you should do sketches together. And more and more we were doing sketches from different writers who sent them in, young writers. And one particular writer called Johnny Spate was sending stuff in. And his stuff was quite different and very original. And we did more and more of Spate's sketches until in the end it finished up that Johnny Spate wrote all the sketches. And Arthur evolved from being a music hall stand-up comedian into being a sketch comedian. And I evolved from being a sort of all-rounder, done a lot of different things, into a straight man. When you work very closely with somebody, you, you get a sort of empathy, a, an intuitive understanding. You never speak at the same time. It's strange. You, you get the messages, I think, through the eyes. And on this occasion, I was a bank manager because I was always the figure of the establishment, and he was always the representative of the working man. And he used his tramp carrier to come into this bank to borrow some money. And he was going on chatting, and suddenly I looked at him, and I could see he'd gone. He just looked at me like that, which he always did. So I said, uh, try to help him out. I said, Mr. Haynes, I think perhaps the word you could be searching for now is collateral. He said, Mr. Nicholas. <laughs> That's the way he used to put me down. Mr. Nicholas, that's very strange you should say that because that was the very word I was searching for. Now, how could you have known that I wanted to use that very word at this time? And, of course, I start to giggle, which the audience loved, and they would go. And then he start feeding on that, saying, yeah, you're very naughty of you, Nick Nicholas. You're laughing at me now. And so we'd ad-lib and gag around this because he never learnt it. And once, actually, a journalist wrote and said... Arthur Haynes has got the greatest televisual face you could imagine. When the camera cuts to him in close-up and he looks at Nicholas Parsons, his straight man, you can read oceans of meaning into that look. All he's saying is, what's the next line? <laughs> and that also reminds me, it was about this time that just a minute began. And uh, I didn't want the job. I actually went to Ian Messeter, who created the show, uh, I guess I'd just done a very successful satire show called Listen to the Space. And I wanted to be on a panel of a comedy show. And I took Ian Messeter's idea up to the head of Light Entertainment. They decided to do the pilot. And I was going to be on the panel, and Jimmy Edwards was going to be the chairman. And David Hatch, just come down from Cambridge with the Footlights, was the director. And um, Jimmy Edwards was never free on a Sunday when they wanted to record the pilot program to see if it all worked. And David Hatch got so frustrated with this. In the end, he said, I think the best thing to do, Nicholas, is you go on and take the chair for the pilot, and Derek Nimmo's free, so he can come on the panel. And I said, but David, I don't want it. I don't think I'm right for the job. I don't think I can do it. He said, I'll do a deal with you. Be the chairman for the pilot show, and then if we get the series, you can go on the panel. So the pilot show was only so-so. And actually, they didn't want a series. They didn't think it would ever work. But David was very persuasive, and he fought very hard and got us our first series. And then he said to me, Nicholas, you're, you're landed with it. I can't change now. You are the chairman. And I said, oh, I don't know. I don't want it. Then he had an inspiration. He brought Kenneth Williams in as well. We, on the original pilot, it was Clement Freud, Derek Newman, and two others who didn't work very well. Kenneth Williams came in, and then lovely Peter Jones as well. And we had those four fellas, and it slowly took off. Kenny took a long time to find his feet and I took a bit of time to find my feet until I just said to him after about four or five shows, David, I've noticed that the show is sort of changing emphasis. Up to now, they've all sort of been scoring points off each other at, at their expense. Now they all seem to be turning on me. <laughs> and he said a very shrewd thing. He said, Nicholas, I think that's the way the show is going to develop. And I think your shoulders are broad enough to take it. <laughs> and I suddenly realized what my role was. I'd been a straight man to different comedians, including Benny Hill very successfully and others. And I realized then what I had to do 
was to be a good straight man to the team, actually. Orchestrate it, keep it going, keep it moving, and often throw out the line so they'd come back and put me down. But mind you, in recent years, they haven't half put me down, haven't they? <laughs> and the more they put me down, the more the audience... And they laugh, they applaud now as well. <laughs> I mean, there was one occasion when, when Derek Nimmo said, he said, um, I, I, I happen to know that, that Nicholas actually is, is, is much older than he looks. In fact, I, I can tell you that he, he hasn't been intimate with a woman for many years. The last one was a suffragette. <laughs> and Peter Jones, who always came in wonderful lines, suddenly pressed his brother and said, yes, and that was only because she was tied to the railings at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Barry Crow, my dear friend, he was guesting on it once or twice, and <laughs> Barry came up with a line. We'd all been having a go about something, and he suddenly pressed his brother and he said, Nicholas Parsons is the kind of person that once you've met him, he's difficult to forget. <laughs> but well worth the effort. <laughs> About that time, I got a phone call from the head of uh, production at Anglia Television. Would I like to do a quiz show? And he showed me the video of an American show called Sale of the Century, in which a very laid-back compare was asking some very highly hyped-up contestants a few simple questions, and they were getting boats and ships and cars for winning them. So, anyway, I said, I can't do that, um, I don't think it's my scene, but, you know, as an actor, I think I could pace it, you know, get a bit of excitement in. Let's start with easy questions and build up, and then latterly I'll, I'll go very quickly and pace it up like that, you see. And he said, that's a bit good, you get a bit of drama in. And I used to write all the questions originally, and I used to get very simple five-pound questions. I mean, there's one wonderful moment that just reminds me, when the easy questions, one pound, I read out the question... What should you not do if you live in a glass house? And this woman pressed her buzzer and said, Take a bath. <laughs> Which was a brilliant answer. If it had been a comedy game show like just a minute, you would have given them a bonus point. I wanted to give her more money. And what I have to do? I had to take money away from her because it's the wrong answer. Uh, but uh, there were some great moments and it was a great success. The trouble is, you know, that if you have an amazing commercial success, you often get so highly associated with it. In fact, somebody said to me, reminded me the other day, I've forgotten who it was. Um, it might have been my friend Peter Jones. He said, he said, you know, everybody's will always be associated, they've achieved anything, showbiz, with one thing in particular. You know, with James Cagney will be, you dirty rat, you dirty rat. Um, Humphrey Bogart, play the game. And, and other people will always be associated with one show or one thing they did. He said, I think with you it's always going to be live from Norwich. <laughs> You know, it's, it's wonderful. Um, I'd also do a lot of after-dinner speaking, and um, that's, a, that's a terrifying world. Again, it's introductions, which, which can be, you know, marvellous. But they can, if they're not good, be very difficult to follow. I mean, there's one occasion when one has a big, important dinner, and there's one of these chaps in the red coats, you know, the MCs, you know. And often there are, some of them are just frustrated actors. Don't quite get it right. And this chap banged his gavel and said, My lords, ladies, and gentlemen... It's time uh, for your speaker. It gives me pleasure to introduce somebody to you, what is known to you very well, from the great world of show business. You have seen him in the theatre. You have seen him on the television. You have heard him on the radio. Will you now please pray for the silence of Nicholas Parsons? <laughs> It's, uh, I'm not going to try and follow that, because you've been such a warm, lovely, responsive audience. It's been a thrill and a pleasure to be here and perform to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.